All right, greetings to everyone out there on YouTube and on Facebook. I am so excited to be experimenting with a new platform. As you can see, we kind of have a new look to the teacher talk today. And uh, I'm able to broadcast live to both YouTube, the YouTube channel that has all of our teacher talks archived, as well as Facebook, uh, which is where we've been uh, with the previous teacher talks. I'm so excited to have this platform and you should, I don't necessarily know what you're seeing on your end, but you should be able to provide comments and post questions as we're having this conversation today. And I strongly encourage you to do that. I am thrilled to be welcoming a, both a colleague and a good friend of mine, Francesca Mieja, and she is uh, coming to us from Texas, um, where I had my career in public education and where I was born and raised. I'm a very proud Texan. I still argue with a lot of people that's one of the greatest countries on earth, uh, but it's, it's a different situation now. For most people that know me, I moved up to the Pacific Northwest. I now live in Seattle and serve as the Director of Music Education and Orchestral Activities at Seattle Pacific University, go Falcons. Um, and so I am learning a lot about this new part of the country geographically and culturally in terms of the philosophies that are embedded in the Pacific Northwest about music and education and the arts and politics. And so this has been a huge part of my journey is to be in a new space with new people, establishing a new community for myself and my family and trying to figure out what the world looks like from a new perspective. Being born and raised in Texas, it's all I have known. And I have benefited from being raised in Texas, not only through my arts education, but also in my professional life and in my schooling to be in Texas and, and learn from incredible educators and mentors that live there. But now I'm in this new space. And so a part of these talks is reaching out to people that I've established relationships with like Francesca and having conversations about topics in music and education and inviting you all to join that conversation. This is a beautiful time right before we went live. I was just talking with Francesca about this is a terrifying time because the traditions that we have inherited have been challenged and we are having to find new ways to facilitate learning in the arts. Uh, but in that comes an opportunity to imagine something brand new and to try things that we've never tried before to maintain that connection to our students and our communities through the arts. So that's exciting. And this is a product of that. I originally started these conversations uh, for those of you that be watching this for the first time, since we're in a new platform on YouTube, these were uh, an opportunity for me to stay connected with my college students that are studying to be future educators. Uh, the pandemic hit Seattle. It was the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States and our university appropriately shut down almost immediately. And we transitioned to online engagement with our students. And so I wanted to create an opportunity for me to still engage with them. Uh, as the school year finished and we transitioned it in the summer, I wanted these conversations to continue so that my students would be thinking about the arts and education and, and what's coming um, in future years. We are all dramatically transformed by this experience, humbled by this experience of having to react to a global pandemic and rethink, reimagine learning and teaching in the arts and in education. And so these conversations have just sort of matured. Uh, those that have watched any of the previous talks know that uh, nothing is sacred. We talk about anything and everything because there, there's this beautiful complexity to what it is that we do as students and teachers and learning in the arts. And so uh, today we're talking with Francesca. I'm, I'm kind of stalling a little bit. I see people coming in and out of this conversation and joining us. Please feel free to post your comments and questions. I always want to give a few minutes at the hour so that people can come and, and join us as they are able. Uh, but I'm bringing Francesca in today to talk specifically about trying to go back to school. And this is has become, I would say, I don't know if this is the right way to approach it, but I would like to argue that this has become a political issue because I don't think that it should necessarily be politicized, but it's become a political issue. Uh, it's affecting different communities in different ways all over the country and the rest of the world. I'm in the Pacific Northwest and I wanna offer that persp perspective, but as I mentioned, Francesca's in Texas. And so she has a unique perspective. Texas has become sort of a, a oh my gosh, an epicenter of this controversy around trying to open the schools and what that looks like with what local politicians are doing, what national politicians are doing and highlighting Florida and Texas. Um, and so I wanted to bring her in because she is doing incredible work. I hope I can embarrass her a little bit. 
has been an amazing advocate for teachers in particular as we are trying to return back to schools, but also thinking, I mean, sincerely about what her students' needs are and what her community needs are. And so any of you that are friends with Francesca on social media, you have uh, bared witness to the incredible advocacy that she's doing. So I immediately thought I wanna reach out to her and have her as a part of this conversation. Um, I think I have talked enough and offered a good enough introduction. Let me do my quick plugs so I can turn it over to Francesca to hear about some of the things she's been working on. Again, for those that might be joining us for the first time, these are Teacher Talks. They are sponsored by the Falcon Feathers. This is a student organization at Seattle Pacific University. Feathers stands for Future Educators in the Arts, Transforming the Human Experience and Realities. These are all future educators in the arts that are seeking their bachelor's degree in teacher certification at SPU, where I serve as the director of music ed and orchestral activities, as mentioned earlier. Um, I am working at SPU and enjoying learning more about the Pacific Northwest and loving Seattle, even in spite of uh, social distancing and quarantining, where, which is necessary. The pandemic is unfortunately alive and, and still affecting a lot of people in the state of Washington and in Seattle. Um, but the, it's been amazing up here to meet new people, connect with new students and colleagues. And so I'm excited to bring that perspective. But one of the things that I bring into these talks is that SPU is a Christian institution, it has a Christian identity, and it's a part of my pedagogy, which is new for me coming from public schooling. And so I like to start these talks with just a quick moment of prayer, just to ground us and center us. Um, and, and however prayer works for you, if that's something that you participate in regularly, whatever it means to you, this is really just a moment of sort of solace and humility to sort of ground us into this conversation. So for people that are watching, uh, I'm just gonna say a brief prayer before I turn it over to Francesca to share some of the work she's been doing. Um, and as you see fit, please uh, join me in this moment. Lord God, we are so grateful for the incredible resources that you provide us and the opportunities that you give us. I am always humbled at the service that you allow me to do to bring people together to talk about arts and education, whether they are students or colleagues or educators in various fields, K through 16. I hope that these conversations go to nurture the hearts and minds of everyone involved in education, parents, students, administrators, teachers, politicians, everyone that affects what teaching and learning looks like in our individual cities, communities, country. I hope that this brings something to fruition in their lives, that it helps change positively the things that we are actively working to doing. Thank you for this time. Thank you for my friend Francesca and the incredible work that she's doing and the things that we are going to learn from her. I pray that this conversation reaches many more people than are able to tune in today and that they see an opportunity for real change and a positive force to be awakened in their community through the arts. We pray in Jesus' name and thank you for this time. Amen. Um, so I've got my kiddos in the background. You can probably hear them, but Francesca, I am going to stop talking. I want to hear about the incredible things you're doing and the advocacy that you've already achieved and talking about going back to school this fall uh, and what that means and how we engage with it. So thank you again and again for being here and tell us what's going on with you, what you've been up to. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm, this is something I'm obviously incredibly passionate about. Um, two parts is, you know, the reopening of schools and then what that looks like when we do either the distance learning or when we do go back in person. But as many people know, it's, you know, like you mentioned, biking cases. And right now, we're getting a little bit more flexibility from the Texas Education Agency as of Friday. Like this is how late they are to the game, but we've been fighting this from the get go as far as, you know, even in April, you've got educators talking about, this is the time to really be creating that robust online curriculum. You know, we have months before the fall semester, but instead of using that time wisely, we've just, We've had to just fight instead, and we've been fighting all summer and putting a lot of pressure on school districts, local authorities, health authorities, county judges in order to ensure that we stay in distance learning. And that's a lot of what we've been fighting for. Um, definitely, a, uh, it has been an opportune moment to show collective power. You know, we have uh, elective representatives. We have a governor. We just had a mask order on July 3rd was when we did, when he came out with an executive order to mandate masks after, you know, thousands of people have died. 
in Texas. It's spiking. And he then he brings in that order on July 3rd. You know, and school districts are putting together plans without people being represented on those plans, you know. Um, I was lucky enough to be on our re-entry task force for the district. I have some opinions about that that people can talk to me personally about. But, you know, you've got a lot of people that are crying out for, you know, to be heard and to be taken seriously and have COVID-19 taken seriously, yet our elected representatives, our local representatives, whether it's a school board or a superintendent, are almost silencing a lot of people and they're not really listening. And that's what a lot of teacher associations in Texas, even non-union teachers, I mean, they are organizing and they're trying to make their voice heard and demanding distance learning. And that's our big demand at this point. And it's all about escalating those demands where, you know, at first we're like, we need distance learning. Okay. How long do we need? Okay. We're going to get three weeks. So the state gave us three weeks. Well, we need at least nine weeks because that will give us past uh, Labor Day, because the, the research is showing every time there's a holiday, COVID cases spike. So we need to see something well after Labor Day if we're going to bring kids back. And now we're just escalating the demand even more. Okay, we want to be in distance learning until Travis County Health Authority puts our COVID cases back at a level two, which we haven't been at a level two since March. And we probably won't be at a level two until maybe next March, you know, and that's the reality. And I, I say I love the argument in a sarcastic way when people are like, oh, you just don't want to reopen the school. You just don't want to teach. It is a massive falsehood to assume that teachers don't want to teach. This is why we do. We love teaching. And, you know, we're not talking about keeping schools closed. We're talking about keeping campuses closed. We want to go back to learning. We want the return. Amen. That is a huge, I want you to say that again. That's such a huge distinction. And I've not heard someone articulate it that way. I love that. We're talking about closing schools. We're talking about keeping families and students and staff safe. We want to keep teaching. We just want to ensure that I'm safe, my children are safe, my family is safe, my students are safe. I do not want to go to a funeral of a student. I don't want to go to a funeral of a student's parent who was infected from COVID because their child went back to campus, picked it up somewhere, brought it home, and now their parent or their grandparents. And people should really recognize, you know, a lot of our families, depending on where you are, whether it's like high poverty area, whether you have minorities in your school, a lot of these families live in multi-generation dwellings. You've got houses that are my aunt and uncles, my grandparents live with us, my mom and dad, my cousins, and you could potentially wipe out entire namesakes, right? Entire families. Because when you bring it into the home, everyone can get infected. So again, we love teaching. We want to teach our kids. If there's anyone more upset, it's the teacher because, you know, I feel like and when we came into the spring and all of a sudden we're distance learning, you know, as music educators, we had to can like our UIL got canceled after all that hard work. And I had a really hard time and not a lot of people know this. And certainly my students didn't know this, but like I had a very dark depression and a lot of it came from. I am one, a very active, a very energetic person and staying at home, sitting on a computer was really difficult for me. It was a lot of work to manipulate distance learning. I don't think parents and community people that are rallying, oh, they just don't want to work. Distance learning is a lot more work than in-person learning. A Especially lot. when you've never been trained for it. And nobody was yeah. trained for this. And, that, and so I got really depressed because I am fueled by being around people. I am yeah. uplifted by- Most educators are. Yeah, and we don't wanna be at home. I teach orchestra. Like, I don't wanna do that from home, but I understand what's happening in the world right now. We have a president who is politicizing a pandemic, which is gonna be deadly for so many people and children. And I love hearing the, re when I, again, I say love in a sarcastic way. I love hearing the research like, Children, transmission rates are low. A lot of children don't get infected. Well, remember, we've been keeping children at home since March. 
Yeah, it's that, you know, what's it's cherry picking the statistics, which is, I mean, everyone is guilty of right now. I mean, regardless, I think that's one of my issues is trying to to reinforce the polarity that is rampant in social and cultural thinking in America, that it's good or bad, right? It's conservative or liberal or whatever labels you want to put on it. It is not black and white. It can't be. There's too much gray area and it's in ignoring that. You brought up a great point I wanted to highlight um, and, th and speaking statistically, because I know this conversation makes people uncomfortable, but it's things that we need to be talking about it. It's that gray area that statistically speaking, the multi-generational homes are in lower income areas. So, and, and I bring that up only to say, there's one, you know, there's one idea of, well, we need to open the schools and we're going to open it up and you're in an affluent area with a very insulated family that has an incredible amount of resources and infrastructure within their community. And so notice, and I'm intentionally not bringing race into the conversation yet, buck your seatbelts because I am going to bring it up because it needs to be talked about, but I don't bring it in yet because I'm talking about you're in an affluent area the home that you're living in was already hardwired for internet. You have an incredible infrastructure from when that community was built. You're not in an older home. You're in a brand new home that's all wired with internet. You have multiple computers in the house. Parents are not necessarily having to work from home or if they are working from home, there's an office. Every kid has their own bedroom. There is an infrastructure for that student to be successful. And then you juxtapose that to a poor community that doesn't have inter like literally doesn't have access to the internet because Time Warner or whomever hasn't laid the cables. Like there's no infrastructure. They're sharing a room with siblings or they have multiple generations in one family. And so you're trying to force that kid to go back to school. And hey, maybe you're lucky. Maybe that kid and the mother and the father and the siblings are all asymptomatic. And so they're carrying the virus and no one is quote unquote technically affected because no one gets sick. But in the poorer communities that statistically speaking are multi-generational, you have people that are immunocompromised or you have an aunt or an uncle that are battling cancer or fighting something that makes them immunocompromised. And those are the people that pass away or they get sick. And so it's like the, the infrastructure is already showing the disparities of who's going to be affected by this virus. And we're looking at the affluent, we're looking at these small examples of success and then saying everybody needs to be subjected to it. So that's my rant, but I had to highlight that because you bring up such a good point. And I'm glad you did. And there's so many more pieces you can highlight out of that, that I've discussed with, you know, trying to rally this demand and, you know, people don't see you're wanting students to crowd a building, right? And it's definitely gonna be a lot of those low income families that are gonna be like, well, I have to work, I have to do this, I'm gonna send my kid. Apartment complexes, most of them don't have laundry facilities, right? So you're gonna have this kid come home, potentially sharing an apartment with several other members, extended family. We're not, they're not gonna be able to wash their clothes on the daily, which, if I'm going into a campus, I'll be wearing scrubs and washing them on the daily, you know, and they also, you know, are they going to be able to take a shower that night? If, if the five younger siblings have to take a shower, there's so many levels that make this a deeper issue that people aren't talking about. And what's really unfortunate, and I've given a bit of criticism to my district and other districts is that when we're surveying parents about their feelings, they're digital surveys their emails being sent out or they're on Facebook or it's, you know, it's on the website and it's like, yes, families, are you now silencing because they don't have internet? They don't have an email. I have a lot of parents who don't have emails. I teach at a low, uh, SES. I teach at a high minority school. A lot of my parents are not English speakers. I'm very blessed to have the language line, a resource our district uses that is a kind of an interpreter I can call in. But a lot of those parents are like, I don't have email. Like you need to call me, but we have districts sending out parent surveys, which most of them sent those out in June, right? That is already out of date, right? This is a new time. Our, our cases are spiking, but I can't stop thinking about how many people are we silencing because of this. And I just want to do a shout out to San Marcos because that's where you're coming from. 
I'm really excited to see their reopening plan and I had a bit of a preview and you know part one of the ways they're very community centered and one of the ways they're reaching out to their families is you know their summer food service they can pick up lunches and they are taking a piece of paper and taping it to the lunch sack call this number so we can discuss what you need why aren't we seeing that why is the only way you're you're gathering data through a digital base because now you've got districts making plans based off of skewed data you are silencing families by keeping it all digital you need to be calling you need to be sending letters you need to be I mean, doing everything possible. And I don't see a lot of that happening. And it's infuriating because we're trying to keep people safe. And the people we really need to prioritize are those families that don't have the internet and that don't have the email to check that, you know, your school district sent a survey to see how you feel. And then I'm just going to touch very briefly a lot of these surveys. I just talked to some teachers from Hutto. I know our survey in our district their readability is crap. Like the questions are, it's like eighth grade star, right? Because if anyone knows that went through a lot of lawsuits because the readability for those questions, I mean, you, it's hard to read the questions. It, it, they're worded weird, like the multi choice answers. It's almost a way to like force a different answer out of you. And if it's the readability is weird for teachers. I mean, what is it going to be like for someone with a language barrier? You know, even exactly. We have these, you know, in our district, we it came out in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, right? But I can't imagine the readability of the Spanish version. You know, if the English version was super weird. So, how many people are we really silencing? And of course, those are going to be the people we need to prioritize in this. And you have to forgive me because this is. I don't want this to seem somewhat subversive, and I don't want to sort of create an issue out of nowhere. But this is a word that has come up in so many conversations I've had lately, especially around our response to the pandemic. And so not just in terms of schooling, but just in general, this idea of performativity, which is you know this fancy academic word, but especially as an art educator in the performing arts, it is you know this concept that what we're doing is putting on a show. We're gonna make it look like we're really interested in collecting data or serving our students, but our actions speak to the opposite of that. And that's what's frustrating me about some of the responses that I'm seeing or reactions. There's a difference between a reaction and a response. And I think we're seeing more reactions than we are responses. But in some of the responses, it's this act of performativity. It's this like, okay, well, we're gonna send out a survey and it's exactly what you're articulating. We're gonna send out the survey, but it's only gonna be in English. We're going to send it out and it's going to be so convoluted or so confusing about what information we're asking for, what feedback we're asking for, that we're not actually going to get the information back. Or, and this is something I've become incredibly sensitive to, you see these surveys come out or you see this, where's the data? I am not necessarily a quantitative person. I, I believe that data can be valuable to track trends and, and notice patterns, uh, but I don't believe in running schools through data. I'll put that aside. That's another conversation for another day. But it bothers me that we'll get the survey and, and my mother still lives in Central Texas. She lives in San Marcos. Um, I have twin baby brothers. Both of them are in school in San Marcos CISD where I worked. Uh, so I am still connected and, and seeing some of this stuff. And, and like you said, I think San Marcos is doing a great job. So this is not an open criticism towards them. But in general, you see the surveys, but then we never actually see the results. From the community's perspective, we're not seeing what was it that you got back? How did you filter it? Is there one administrator in an office on the communications team that is receiving all of this data and filtering it and delivering it to the superintendent? People, that's a problem. If we have one person looking at it, like how is that? And, and you know, you can have death by committee. I'm not suggesting that I have the answer for every district. Everybody's different. So trying to get a whole bunch of people together with the pandemic going on and siphon through data and all that, like I get that it's complicated. I'm not saying that it is the answer, but I think we need to be a lot more critical about what it is that's being published and what we're receiving, because as you've already pointed out, here's a short list that we're able to spit off the top of our heads of voices that are being easily silenced by the platforms that we can see that we're engaged with 
the surveys that are going out, the phone calls or text messages that are being sent out, the uh, statements that are being made on websites, we can already look at that and tell you, I can guarantee that these voices have been silenced because of the means of communication that are open. And yet we're not actually doing the follow-up. We're just saying, well, my district put a survey out, so we're getting information. Are we? How many people responded? How did you actually analyze the data? Like that conversation seems to be missing in so many places. And that's so huge. Like how many people are responding? Like, is this an appropriate sampling of data to actually create, you know, valid assessment from these voices that are put having that input? And the answer is no. No. Yeah. Well, because you hear, well, we're going to make this decision and we sent out a survey. But what you're not hearing is we sent out a survey and we heard back from 10 people, 10 overzealous people that are desperate to open the schools because it benefits their personal situation. Those are the 10 people we heard back from. So what I'm going to do is hold the press conference or make the statement online. We did a survey and we got an overwhelming uh, support to open the schools. Who, who responded? How many respondents were there? How did you mitigate you know, the, the negative or positive feedback? But I feel like that, again, th I think that's an oversimplification to say that there's negative and positive feedback because it's complicated. But like, how did you mitigate the people that wanted it opened and didn't want it open? It's just, it's so much more complicated than we're trying to make it. And, it, and then the piece is, if you make a great point, like, why isn't this data being released to the community? Like, I love to see, I got, pri I was privy to some of that data because I was on the reentry task force, but it wasn't necessarily public. Now, you could do a public information request, right, with your district, because all of the, all of the actions and doings are subject to a PIA. But at the same time, a lot of districts have closed that, you know, opportunity down. We try, we, we do them all the time as a union, and we've let recently be getting, been getting back overclosed, you know, due to this and that. So, and like you mentioned, the show and the performance, it's ridiculous. A task force with 50 people is not a task force, right? A task force that doesn't have adequate teacher representation from each campus, or at least from each feeder pattern is not a task force. Talk about it. Come on. A task force that does not have parents from each feeder pattern or each campus is not a task force. And a task force that neglects the actual student body is certainly not a task force. Or how about every part of the community? Every Again, that's this, what's bothering me. It's parents from one sector of the community. And I know, and I, and I want to admit this, I'm speaking from a place of privilege as a white cisgender male in America. Like that is something that I own. And I can imagine that people are listening and making that assumption that somehow I'm I'm painting this aggression towards uh, conservative, wealthy white people and communities. I want to make sure people understand that's not the case. I'm talking about bias data consumption, making decisions off of data that is not reflective of your community, because there are several examples of which there are communities that have these zealous parents that are one-sided in their viewpoint. They're thinking about their students and their family and their perspective. And they are the ones that go to the school board meetings. They are the ones that respond to the data. So this could be from poor or wealthy communities. This could be from marginalized communities or affluent communities. I'm not saying that it's one or the other, but we're not getting into the data that's fueling these decisions is the big point. I think that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. It's kind of terrifying too, to think that, you know, you have school districts that are creating these plans that will affect everybody in your community without the input of the community. And that was a big push that we're, we're running a summer campaign that we started doing is like, we need parent and student representation on these task force. What's really unfortunate is you have school districts that like don't even really have a task force or don't even know that it's, you know, teachers. Uh, I was talking to teachers this morning and they're like, I'm like, so who's on the task force or what do you know? And they're like, uh, we don't really know exactly if we even have one or if they've invited teachers to be in there. And in fact, I can tell you right now for my school district, you know, it was a lot of central office admin, campus admin. And as an executive member of my local union, like we put ourselves, we had to reach out and say, we have resources. We have the ear and the voices of almost a thousand of your staff in the district as our members. We need to be on that task force. And that was the only way we got on there. And there weren't many teachers and two of them had to force their way onto it. And here we have, again, a 
committee of some hand-picked source and they're the ones making those decisions and we're not listening to the community in them. And it just baffles me that you have school districts that think they have the best interest of students in mind, but the reality is they have the best interest of student here, student there, her student, that parent's child, not every individual student is in their mind. And I firmly believe that like every time I think about equity in school districts, the reopening piece, how yep. we're getting technology and accessibility to internet access, we are not functioning from a position of every student's best interest in mind. And I love to, I love that you bring it up and I'm so proud again of um, to, to call you a friend and a colleague and hear the work that you're doing, especially through your union, I immediately thought of the great uh, Shirley Chisholm quote, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Um, I love it, yeah. You know, I just, I, I love this idea that we need to be more aggressive about being a part of that conversation. And it's it's disheartening to a certain extent. I mean, I, I don't wanna shift this dialogue because I, I feel like it's so positive. And for me, I'm galvanized by this conversation about what we can be doing different to support more students and more members of the community. But it's disheartening in that when people don't share that fervor of wanting to be at the table to have the conversation or lose their sense of agency, that what's the point? And um, she'll probably yell at me later on Facebook for this, but I, I don't mind. Uh, I think my mother is is in that position because obviously we've been in communication as things have gotten worse, which is is not uh, my you know subjective opinion. It's a fact that things are getting worse in Texas in terms of health and safety with this pandemic. Um, you know, I'm in the Pacific Northwest and and things are not going great, right? Like I'm not I'm not casting disparity on Texas out of judgment. Like I'm casting it out of concern for my family that live there. Uh, as things have gotten worse, I've been in more communication with her, checking in with her, making sure that she's okay as she's done with me. And we're in these conversations and she's expressed frustration about how the city and county are handling things just in the community. This Again, this is not directed towards uh, the school district, but just in the community. And so my response, and to be fair, I am, um, what's the nice PC way of putting it? I'm very passionate. I'm a very passionate person and I'm not afraid to scream and yell. <laughs> so, you know, I talk to her and I'm going, well, you need to reach this person. You need to do this. And she goes, what's the point? Like, she's so defeated. And she's so defeated. That is something I talk a lot about. So again, running a campaign and we have member organizers and they, you know, we're all calling teachers and a lot of teachers, I mean, it, it obviously comes from decades of oppression and decades of defeatist mindset in teachers. Even in teacher prep programs in universities, there's, you know, a lot of them tell teachers, and I know this because I have much more veteran teachers and they're like, you know, at Texas State, they were telling us, you know, we can't do unions, we can't do these things. And so what are we really teaching? This is a right to work state. You better be yeah. careful what you say. I heard that so many times while I was working in Texas. But what are we teaching these incoming teachers as far as like agency and voice and collective action, not collective bargaining, but you know, de the defeatist mindset is real. And I understand it because we have been oppressed for decades. We can't speak out, especially in Texas and right to work states. We don't have these liberties and we just do as we're told by our board or superintendent, whichever one holds the higher power, you know, because some boards don't think they do when everybody here, the school board holds the higher power, not your Come superintendent. On. Amen. Yes. And they're elected officials. But um, it's really sad. And I understand teachers feeling that way. I understand educators feeling so overwhelmed and beaten down and stressed out. But the best thing to do for those people is you just give them those easy, actionable steps. Give actionable steps to say, hey, you know what you could do? Like you have all the right to send an email to your school board. You have every right to share your story on social media. You can call your school board or you can call TEA. Easy, actionable steps really help terrified, overwhelmed people move out of that place of anxiety and become more transformational. So you got transactional people and then you move them to transformational. And it's a hard fight. 
I've been noticing Texas, like I'm just so proud of the over a quarter million teachers in Texas that are rallying and they're rallying hard because, and I've, people who talk to me, I say the same statement all the time. This is our opportunity. This is the opportunity for not just educators, but our citizens in general to organize and speak up, not necessarily just for education, but for health care, various social systems that have been grossly neglected. And I've said it from the beginning of the pandemic, you know, yes, this is terrible. But what the silver lining of a global pandemic is that we are now having light shed on all of those social systems that have been grossly neglected all of them. And now we can rise up together and demand what we want. And especially again, when we have an administration as it is, it is more imperative that we rise up in collective action and speak out against the atrocities and speak up with solutions that are people, co-conspirators coming together and strategizing, finding allies to give those tasks to and demanding that we fix these social systems. Now, granted, we make the argument a lot in our in the social justice world, like the system isn't broken, right? It's doing exactly what it's meant to do. Well, yep. It's time to rewrite them. And it's also time to reconceptualize public education as we know it. And this is the opportunity to do it. Uh, I mean, amen and amen. There's just, <laughs> there's no way I could agree with you more. And I have to, I have to be careful because, um, I, I almost hesitated to take the conversation this route, but you know, again, nothing is sacred. And I think this is exactly what we're speaking into. I am the, of course, I'm going to sound incredibly conceding this, you know, the older I get and the more that I do and uh, my perspective shifts so much. And the, uh, now, now stay with me, I promise I've got a point, but right. the, the consumerism that has bled into our concept of education, that has poisoned education. If, and again, if people will just follow me, because I know I'm gonna sound like this radical conspiracy theorist, but this is lived reality, not only as an educator, but as a student. This idea, and we have, um, and I do say this, unfortunately, I am showing my you know political opinion right now. We have a secretary of education that is doing everything that she can to promote this quote unquote idea of school choice. And I think that is what one of the frustrations and the problems that we're seeing with how schools are responding to the pandemic. So if I can, let me show you the connection. We have this mentality that if we don't like something that's happening in our school, the only option that we have is to leave, right? And this gets perpetuated into the social justice and um, inequality issues that we're seeing across the country. If you don't like it, then you should leave the country, which is asinine. If you don't like it within a democracy, you use your voice and your vote to change the system. You don't just tolerate it. You change the system because you are the one that should be in power, not some overseer, not some politician, not some business owner, not whomever has assumed a position of authority to make decisions. That's not the person that should be with power. It's you as the individual, the constituent that should be in power. So this idea of, because um, literally Secretary DeVos was on the news, it was three days ago that was saying, well, what we need to do is support people's right to leave the schools that are not doing a good job. If you don't like how your school is responding to the pandemic, then you should just leave. And the I, just the sheer selfishness of that, that like, oh, forget this, you know, the, the beautiful democratic education that's been promoted by John Dewey, that, that is the one thing that America can really hold as sort of our invention of the democratic education and what that looks like through Dewey and scholars to say, we have faith in this idea that multiple people from different backrooms, different parts of the community can come together and experience equity in an educational environment. We throw that out the window to say, no, 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 this is consumer based. If you don't like what you're seeing, then you leave and you go. To never give any insight to what are you leaving? You are then leaving all of your colleagues, your neighbors, your peers, your colleagues within your community, you're leaving them behind in a system that you have identified has failed you to just perpetuate failure. Instead of exactly what you're saying, being heard, going to the elected officials, which are your school board, 
going to the paid administration to say, hey, I have a question and I'm going to hold you, the scary word that no one wants to talk about, accountable. I'm not going to have this fight or flight mentality of, I don't like the way that it is anymore, so I'm going to leave. I am going to fight for it. I am going to articulate. These are the problems, the concerns that I have, and we're going to hold the administration and elected officials accountable. That is literally the structure of public school systems in America. That's how they're designed. But what we've done is, is bought into this fear mongering of exactly what my mother is suffering, what so many people are suffering of. Well, it's pointless. It's not going to do any good. It's more work on my part. And the school should just X. The school should just offer me what it is that I need. They should know my needs. They should know. I want to actually, for people that are listening to this and assuming that I'm attacking administrators and elected officials, it's actually quite the opposite. I think what we've done is put them in a position where it's all or nothing, where they have to know your needs and meet your needs with limited resources. Administrators don't know what they don't know. The only way that they can address your needs is if you bring it to them to say, hey, here are my concerns about the survey that went out. Here are my concerns about returning to school. If you're not using those platforms to communicate, you can't then in the same breath blame the administration in the school district for not doing what it is that you need. And these are conversations I'm having, like I said, with my own mother and with people that I know. Well, I'm just so frustrated the school hasn't done this. Did you tell them they needed to do it? You're talking about a very specific cultural situation that you are in, which is valid. It needs to be heard. But, but have you told them that you were concerned about that? Well, no, because there's no point. Yeah. And it's happening everywhere. And it's always been that way, right? It's always been this kind of complicit, oh, they know what I need. But I feel like, you know, people, this, now I'm kind of tangenting out, you know, people talk about like, oh, we're so polarized, right? The, the political parties are so polarized these days. And then I tend to think about, you know, they have, you know, conjectures of why it's polarized. But at the same time, my brain goes to, well, it's 2020, right? We have so many new cultures and new mindsets and new individuals and new identities where it's really clashing with, you know, the old guard mindset, conservative mindset, right? And I feel like people have always just felt like, oh, it's like a done system. You know, we've we're polarized. No one really knows. We can't speak up. And I'm like, absolutely not. Like you mentioned, it's their job to know what we need. And we have to let them know our Texas representatives, you know, and God bless them because they've been slammed with calls and emails. And I know many of them, you know, shout out to Representative Celia Israel, you know, many of them are giving the same messaging, you know, and demanding the same thing for distance learning, but we have to go to them. And what that really is, is it's, ac it's activating our civic duty, just like voting and people are like voting, whatever. Oh my God. Yes. You don't understand. And people are like, oh, I just vote for the president. That doesn't even matter. Although now with the whole electoral college piece from the SCOTUS uh, decision, that's great. This is going to matter. But, you know, people don't get that school board election is huge because school boards do so much more. And I don't think a lot of communities understand that, you know, they're deciding your property tax rate. They're deciding traffic flow. They're deciding, you know, um, whether or not there's going to be a campus built in your backyard, you know, they decide so many things and you really want to know who's on that school board. And if you have school board members talking in a school board meeting and they're like, oh, so when does the school year start? You're a trustee, right? That's the word trustee. You should know when the school year starts. You should understand what distance learning will look like when the school year starts. But you have these school board members that are almost really out of touch with what's really going on. And it's like, okay, my power is I can get you unseated and put someone else in your place because that's what I need in my community. And we have to do it. We have to vote. We have to make our voice heard. And what's interesting is, I keep thinking about this, you know, if everyone in collective action, you know, I am now activating my right as a voter and I'm demanding my representatives represent what I want and what I feel because that's their job. Their job is to represent what you need. And you're right. We have to tell them. And you mentioned, you said it perfectly earlier. We're not attacking, right? 
this isn't an attack. And as an, a, as a representative of my local association on my campus, like I never, I never felt like I'm attacking my principals. If there's an issue with the staff, if there's an issue on campus and I'm letting my principals know, and I'm always graceful and I'm always, you know, help me understand. I'm trying to make it a better environment and I'm trying to save your job as an admin because there might be some huge issue here that we need to work through. We're not attacking. We're trying to make this a better community, a thriving community that serves everyone, not the affluent, not the ones with the resources to speak up, not the privileged few. We need to demand that our representatives are representing everybody. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't have the resource to speak up. And that's where we come and play. That's where we call and we email and we talk to people every day. We share their stories when we can share their stories and we use their voice and ele elevate that voice up to those representatives. It's really insane that we are in the year 2020 and we still have so many people who don't vote because in the social justice world, the only way to combat racism is voting out racist policy, period. Come on, yes. Period. <laughs> Well, and it's crazy. We've actually, we've sort of come full circle from where we started with the initial conversation of, you know, how we're responding to this pandemic and what that looks like and the significance of the engagement. And I think it's fair, especially, especially at this point in this conversation to articulate, you know, I do not envy school administrators, elected officials right now. Like they're having to navigate so much. Absolutely. But the idea the idea that they just have to clairvoyantly know what the problems are and that we as citizens within these communities, these school districts, these businesses, these cities, that we don't have a responsibility to communi be communicating our own needs, it really is ridiculous and it's irresponsible and it only perpetuates the problem. It, and it, do it really does. And again, I go back to so many people just don't vote. So many yeah. people don't vote and so many people don't even vote in the general president election, but like not voting in your yearly, you know, Senate elections, local government elections, again, the school board elections, you know, it's huge to make your voice heard. And that's the best way to start. And then, it, you know, I think that's the first step. That's one action. And if people can't get there, then how can we get them to even voice their concerns or what they need to those representatives. It's like another step. But to me, and some people can really disagree, but it's our civic duty to vote and to speak up to our representatives so that way they are properly representing us. Yes. And if we just not, if we cease to do it or we continue not doing it, nothing's gonna get fixed. And then we're back at Betsy DeVos. Oh, this is broken. I'm just gonna leave because I have the choice to leave and people forget. And I can go on forever, a whole other teacher talk about school choice. <laughs> what are you leaving? Exactly. Like you you're leaving those friends. You're leaving those students who may have been excelling sitting next to your child. You're leaving, you're taking resources away from those communities when you just leave. And now they will continue to fail and they will continue to harm students. It's terrifying. And people just think, oh, I can leave. And it's almost like that mentality I can go into so well is I'm just going to defriend you. Like it's too much energy to like, yes, there is. I don't want to do the civic discourse here. I'm just going to defriend you. You don't agree with me. I'm just like, it's all about civic discourse. Like you talk about polarizing, unless you're able to talk to someone, we're always going to be polarized. And so many people have just taken that, you know, stance of, Oh, whatever. We're done. I'm defriending you. Now nothing will happen. You or the I'm gonna I'm gonna block you. I'm gonna um, block. This yeah. was a conversation that came up with my my very dear friend uh, Dr. Shana Mascheco when we were talking about racism in music and education, and I had I had posted something that was obviously very politicized, sort of calling out some of the systemic prejudice that exists um, in politics. It wasn't specific to music or education, but I pointed that out, and and I. I got attacked, right? Like on, you know, these trolls that came in and sort of attacked me. And it was, it was powerful for me because several of my friends, several of my friends who not so ironically all happen to be people of color 
were very apologetic and very sincere about, I'm so sorry you had to deal with that. And the response was block those people, unfriend them, because you don't need that kind of negativity in your life. Without getting too far on this tangent, what frustrated me is I said, number one, the fact that that is our reaction is a form of privilege. The fact that we can say, here's the dissenting opinion and there's someone that doesn't agree with me. So rather than suffer, which is true psychologically, suffer this, this heated debate or this you know controversial conversation in which we're at each other's throats right through social media platforms or whatever it is, the fact that I could just turn that off and ignore it, particularly as a cisgender white man in America, that's a form of privilege on my part. You know what? I'm just going to close my laptop and now I don't have to worry about systemic prejudice. No, it still exists regardless of whether or not I feel uncomfortable on this conversation in social media. And I don't need to be a martyr. I don't need to suffer psychologically, you know, with engaging in hateful conversations or in platforms that are not going to support me in terms of my own mental health. But at the same token, you just said it, and I'm just reiterating it. You have to get into the discourse. You have to have the conversations. You have to communicate needs and wade through those to figure out what the mediating, cir mediating circumstances could be. And I wanted to give what I hope is an effective analogy. Imagine being at home and being sick and having a primary care physician and complaining that you still don't have a prescription to fix your ailment. And everyone around you saying, well, did you go to the doctor? Did you go tell them what was wrong so that they could diagnose it and give you a prescription? No, they're my primary care physician. They've known me for years. They should know what's wrong with me. They should know that I'm sick. I shouldn't have to go down there and tell them what's going on for them to be able to fix me. Like how absolutely ridiculous does that sound? And in the exact same token, I feel like this is a, a very good analogy to for what, what it is that we're talking about. If you have elected officials, if you have uh, administrators, whatever the role is, whether they're administration within the local municipality or within your school district or even within your job, for you to sit at your home or in your office and say, "Ugh, I don't understand why this problem that I've been having for years is still an issue. Well, have you talked to them about it? Have you gone to them so that they can diagnose that problem and try to start to fix it? Well, no, they should know what's wrong with me. It's their job to know what's wrong with me. Yeah, it's a doctor's job to know how to fix your ailments, but until you make an appointment and go and talk to them, until you follow through and go to the booth to vote, or until you follow through with the email or the survey or whatever the platform is to say, here is the problem, how are we going to address it, not just you, because this is why I say the analogy I think is so appropriate. You can get a prescription from a doctor, but you're not gonna get better unless you actually go fill it and take the medicine. So I think that's the other part of this is that we are seeing school districts moving forward. We are seeing plans come out, but then these plans are only as good as the educators and the community that actually sees it through because we see really good plans of how to open the school. And then we have what I consider sort of crazy people that are going, Forget that. I'm, I heard someone say, I'm dropping my kid off when school opens. And I'm like, what are you doing to your child? You're going to abandon your child at the school because you think they're supposed to be there. Like, we should be furious about statements like that. It's a, and there's so, there are so many statements like that. And I love like the trolling and how you say the trolls. And, you know, the statements are, you know, that's why I pay my property taxes. You know, that's why we pay teachers. So I love the statement of, you know, if I have to teach, if I have to distance learn my students distance learning from home, like I should be paid that teacher salary. I'm sorry. You mean if you're doing what you are already expected to do, which is support the facilitation of learning at, at from Hello. the home, like, yep. that's what you are already should have been doing. Um, but it's terrifying that a lot. That's a lot of the conversation that's happening. And I'm very lucky to be where I am in Pflugerville, right next to Austin. But even like in Lake Travis, you know, you have a lot of communities that are so split and, you you know, 50-50. And you've got parents and teachers that are like, no, we need to be on campus. Like, that's our job. You know, the best place for student learning is in person. Yeah, duh. Absolutely. 
But again, we're going back to saving lives because, and I love the argument, you know, how are they going to do social development from home? You know, they have to get the social development piece and that happens on campus. Well, newsflash, there will be no social development when we go back to campus because kids will be six feet apart. They won't be congregating. They won't be really interacting. There's no group work. There's no partner work. They're wearing masks. They can't be touching each other. No kissing, no holding hands. There's no social development in that. That. And then you have teachers, you know, as an educator, the biggest part of education and pedagogy is that relationship building and the proximity, right? And our power zone for teaching. Where is that going to go? Like that, it just goes out the window when we're having to police the safety protocol, right? You're going to see a lot more teachers having to police these health and safety. Keep your mask on. What are we going to be spending our actual class time doing? Not teaching, not help, not facilitating social development not facilitating social emotional learning because we will be under such strict guidelines that we have to follow. And you mentioned it's going to be up to us to follow through with these actual campus return to learn plans. And that's all we'll be doing. We won't be teaching how, I mean, you, some teachers get 45 minutes in a classroom and the kids will be walking in, you know, one at a time spaced out with hand sanitizer and a wipey. And by the time you get them seated and focused, there's 20 minutes, right? And by the time you're done yelling at this kid for the mask and no, you can't be close to that person, we're already done with class. People well, and it's interesting, you pointed this out earlier, why are we not taking advantage of this opportunity to really um, reimagine the system? Because what we're trying to do is throw these band-aids on a uh, you know, this open gushing wound of like, okay, well, we have to return back to schools. So we're going to keep the 45 minute classes. We're going to have eight classes in a day. We're going to have the rotating block schedules. We're going to have, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Clearly that doesn't work. And so how could we, if someone was going to return to campus, like how can you completely throw everything out the window because it no longer exists because that learning did not take place during a pandemic. So forget that. That model is old now and it doesn't work because we're under new circumstances. And I have I have yet to see it. Definitely doesn't mean it doesn't exist out there. And I would actually love for people to post comments if you've seen this. Why are we not looking at some of the philosophies that we've seen in the 20th century that we know are effective? Why is there not conversations about project-based learning across all campuses? Why are we not talking about small group instruction and how effective that can be? Why are we not talking about Reggio Emilia? Why are we not talking about philosophies that promote the idea of divergent thinking and learning and these, you know, that is doable. That is possible. It works. We could get a small group of students of less than 10 together where the teacher is a supervisor, not the sage on the stage, that they're giving small project-based inquiry where we're able to look at all these things like, and you already pointed it out, and it's actually something I hadn't thought about, which is again, somewhat disheartening, of how has our summer been spent? Of not being able to develop those types of ideas, but working through this politicized system of whether or not the school doors are opened and we have the resources to be able to sanitize every child between periods, instead of looking creatively and divergently at how do we reimagine learning through online platforms and all of that. And the mind shift has to happen. Like we're not going to be successful in educating students. And this is for all the naysayers out there who like, I need my kid to go to campus. And again, there's so much in that piece. Like I understand that it's impossible for some parents to leave their kid at home. I understand that. And that goes into a whole other discussion about this is the time for communities to come together, the school district to be a community piece and so on and so forth. Other discussion. But, you know, we... The mind shift has to happen in the sense of like, there is, first of all, there was no normal, right? We all know that. And there is no going back to whatever was not actually normal. But we can literally make schooling better, more equitable, more accessible. It really is a phenomenal opportunity with distance learning to now bring schooling and learning outside of the classroom to the home where we're not just confined to my four walls, I am now able to teach out there. I'm bridging into your home. It's more, you know, personal to you that I'm here with you and I'm educating you on your time, on your accessibility level. And, you know, I could, 
we could fix all the problems in public education if we reduced class size, period. Amen. <laughs> and we've been fighting for that since the beginning of time. And that, and the question that we haven't actually approached that, you know, we just talk about social distancing. Oh, we're going to social distance. Well, how do you social distance 30 kids in a, you know, a tiny cinder block classroom? You don't. Yeah. But can we talk about reducing kids in a classroom? Oh my gosh, how many problems is that going to solve in the universal scope of issues in public ed, you know, behavior and whatnot with one person actually overseeing? And I love that you brought up the sage on the stage. Like any educator that feels like they are the reason for learning that the learning is happening is sorely mistaken. You know, yep. it comes from the kid. And, you know, we have so many educators that still go with the the bank deposit mindset like yes for the day absolutely education i'm feeding you information i'm totally disregarding your previously lived experience i'm totally disregarding your cultural identities i'm totally disregarding let's mention this people the trauma that these kids are living through right now oh my god yes about going back to school and uh, what content we're going to teach and how we're going to get the star test done uh, we need to address the trauma, like seriously address the trauma. And I can't imagine these students not being further traumatized when we put them back on campus. They will be further traumatized. Imagine the mental and emotional burden that kid will have when they are asymptomatic and bring something home to their family and then grandmother dies from COVID-19. And that kid's now going to know Oh my gosh, that was pro it was me. You know, I went to campus. They just had a breakout on campus. My family all has it now. These kids are being traumatized and putting it back on campus is going to just re-traumatize them again. And right now we are fighting so hard and just I wouldn't say waste time cuz our work is good and um and to quote John Lewis, good trouble, right? But it's like our work is good here but I so desperately wish, and every other educator and some parents too, are so desperately wish that we can utilize this time to create that thriving, robust online distance learning because it's really there and it's really beneficial. And like from a music education standpoint, I could go on forever about the beauty of how we can legitimately change curriculum for music ed, how we can move away from the performance piece and we can move more into like context. Yes understanding we can really focus on cultural relevant the cultural are now like a staple of the curriculum instead of just a reference right and now in distance learning think about we are now taking away the pressure of a student to have to culturally assimilate into the school environment going back into i can now educate you where you're at outside of this school environment. It's the epitome of that philosophy of meeting the student where they are. I mean, it's the epitome of it. And it's huge. And that's a, a big reason like I love music ed and I'm so passionate is it's the perfect vehicle for implementing social justice. It really is, or just art in general. Art is social commentary, right? And now from the distance learning perspective, because we're not having the pressure of performance, which you know, coming from Texas and, you know, perf music performance in Texas is, is so huge. It's so huge. I love that you, I think it was you that mentioned um, market driven consumption of music is music performance, but now we can bridge like performance and scholar. Now we can make researchers out of our students. Well, Research we can teach music with a Absolutely. capital M. We can teach music and not just teach performance from the national standards down. It has never just been performance. And I have to give a, a quick shout out to Dr. Juliet Hess, uh, someone that I met last summer, just published her book, Music Education for Social Change. Um, and I have this on a reading list with my music ed majors. The sub, uh, subtitle is Constructing an Activist Music Education. So if you guys haven't seen this, this book just came out um, and I just ordered my copy of it this summer. Uh, if uh, Dr. Hess is watching, I'm so excited to work through this with my students. She's on social media and readily available for anybody that wants to reach out to her. Um, and I'm excited about the work that she's doing because it's, and, and I just wanted to chime in to say, 
this is again this awesome opportunity to reimagine and exactly what you're talking about is that the music classroom does not have to be restricted to the music classroom that it happens at fifth period and it's only in those 45 minutes of the day that you talk about music and you have these opportunities what you're talking about so eloquently is this idea that you're at school to get an education not just to learn that you're there to be able to break down the walls and the really false barriers that we put between the disciplines that when you're in your music class you can learn music from the civil rights era and talk about its meaning and its social historical context and where it's coming from. And then you can walk across the hallway into your AP US history course and say, I was just talking about this with Miss Mieha. And we, we, we were just discussing how the music did this and oh, let me play it for you or let me sing this melody. Like it when the bell rings, the learning should not stop. It shouldn't stop. And when it should always be, we should always be inspiring and moving our students. And it shouldn't, like you said, when the bell rings, it doesn't stop. And distance learning is really going to help facilitate this. And you brought up the perfect example when they're going over to their other class of project based learning. Yeah. Why can't I have a project, you know, we're distance learning, it's very conflicting, it's very a new territory. But let's move into project based learning where you know, you have a project between my class and your English class and you're studying Shakespeare and we're talking about madrigals and, you know, you get the same grade in both ways where you have a research piece and you're doing the music piece. But, and, but again, we're not thinking outside the box and we will have to think outside the box because the writing on the wall is going to say this and we still need a pressure and we still need to push for distance learning. But if we're being realistic with the way COVID is going in Texas, we're going to have to do distance learning and we need to make it effective. We need to make it equitable, accessible, of high integrity and a positive experience for our students or we're going to fail. We're going to fail. And like I mentioned, you and I were chatting earlier before this is this is just the time to shine as music educators because, you know, kids don't come to school, you know, to go to core classes, sorry guys. They come to have that, you know, individual social emotional need that comes from playing next to their friends and like co collaborating in music or art with their friends. We feed so much of the students emotional and social learning through music. And we can really assist our students in overcoming this trauma in being able to adjust and understand what's going on in the world right now, global Black Lives Movement, global pandemic, so much to think about that's getting put on adolescent minds. And we can utilize the arts to help them understand it. Because if, if we don't, and if we don't do it well, and if we don't make it of high integrity, we can really be hurting ourselves in the music education world. Because even though ESSA, you know, Every Student Succeeds, mentions like music education, well-rounded, needs to be in the well-rounded education, like fine arts and such, that really comes down to how your superintendent will implement that. And this is our time as music educators to really show how desperately important we are to that well-rounded education of a student. And it can really happen. It just takes open minds to think outside of the box. And, you know, I wasn't a fan in the beginning of like the Zoom rehearsals. We just don't have that platform yet to like really have adequate in-time rehearsing mechanisms on a digital platform. You know, it's not there yet. Zoom definitely isn't it. I wasn't a fan of it. I can see why we need to do it because we want our kids to play their instruments and we want our kids to sing, but we can do it in different ways. We can provide music. Exactly. Support. You know, there's Sony music plat learning platforms out there. Get every student a subscription to that. Get every student internet. You want them to play their instrument in their 10 person live uh, house dwelling. Well, get them a silent mute or a silent string instrument and provide these. Well, I want to jump in because you're hitting on so many things. That's that that product based outcome driven learning that we're so married to, particularly in America. It's something that's happening in a lot of countries. But this idea that I only know learning has happened when I can view the product and not necessarily appreciate the process, which ESSA has actually started to promote. And even um, in Texas with the um, it's PADAS, I think that's, that's being used right for teacher assessment. It's all about process. It's a lot more about process. 
um, and being able to see the transition. And I, I wanted to jump in though, because I wanted to, I wanted to sort of combat the, the weaponizing is the way I look at it. It really discourages me that a lot of administrators or community members in general will, will use the arts to justify a lot of curricular or educational decisions. I agree with you that uh, the arts and sports, um, a lot of the, the really anything in the area of liberal arts usually excites students and they want to be coming to school because they don't necessarily have that opportunity anywhere else. If you think about it, you're in your apartment in Houston, you don't have an orchestra in your apartment complex necessarily, right? So being able to have the instrument and engage in music making, yeah, that is a, an opportunity that schools can provide. But what frustrates me is that number one, I think that conflates the ego of our art teachers. And we, we begin to believe that we are the reason that students come to school. And therefore what we do in our classroom is also conflated, that it has this, this hyper importance to students learning in general. And we become, and I, I forgive some people that I know I'm going to offend by saying this, but we look at our system of teaching music uh, every state is different. Every district is different. A lot of it in Texas is driven by competition. And we conflate that and we say, okay, for, for me to have success in my classroom, I have to compete well and it brings pride to the school. And that's why students are coming. My administrator has told me, and I had this said to me many times in my career, kids are coming to school for you. I'm like, okay, great. But shouldn't the goal be to have students come to school to learn? They should not just be coming to school so they can play their instrument. If anything, if I'm doing my job as a music educator, they should be using their instrument and making music everywhere in their life, not just in my classroom. And we will shield that. I've seen it happen politically and professionally that we then only allow students to be making music in our classroom or withhold performance opportunities and educational opportunities so we can create a false sense of importance. And it becomes so damning because it just reinforces those false barriers of you learn math and math, you learn English and English, you learn music and music. And the only reason the kids are coming to school is to have arts and athletics. And so we're going to tease them in. Again, we're going to weaponize it so that this is what we can defend spending all this money on athletics and using all this time for extracurricular activities. We're going to defend the atrocity that has become state assessments and learning in math, English, and social studies and science. There's so much more that can and should be done in those disciplines, but we've boiled it down and reduced it to a standardized education that people have to quote unquote tolerate so they can get all the fancy jewels in public education that are extracurricular activities and performing arts and athletics. And here, here to me is the point. When we move away from the boxes, the tiny boxes that we try to fit everything in, when we think about holistic education, when we think about bringing people in to be able to learn more about the world, when we think about experiential education, project-based learning, like all these things that we know work in isolation, and we try to start making that the standard and we really do transform education and not just put band-aids on things, not just try to perpetuate what it is that we've inherited. That is real, the, where the real benefit lies. And I want my students to see me as a music educator, not as their one respite in the day. Because, and I won't go down this trail, but if we really talk about why are kids coming to school, most kids are coming to school because they're being forced to go to school because we've created punitive laws that tell students, if you don't come to this place from this time to this time and suffer through what we're going to call an education, then you can be arrested and your parents can be fined. I'm speaking as someone that went to truancy court in high school. That's a part of my life that'll come up in another day, but like I went through that system and I'm going, no, kids aren't coming to school so they can go to orchestra. They're coming to school because they're being forced to come to school and the systems are not changing. So. I'll jump off that soapbox, but that's something I think we need to be addressing right now because we have the opportunity to completely reimagine what we're doing. That was so beautiful, Chris. Like, I'm really glad, like I was in line by what you just said in the sense of like, you know, and so many people lose themselves too. So many music directors, so many art teachers lose themselves in that concept. I have lost it. I've been lost in it. And I'm really glad you brought that up. And the whole competition piece, I wanted to jump in. Like music education is so much more than a competition piece. It's about the soul and the mind 
and beautifying the human aspect. We talk about the holistic child and what a beautiful moment to be able to emphasize that when we're doing distance learning. And I can talk about UIL all day, every day, and the oppressive structure that it is, um, and the inequitable structure that it, you know, so many things. But, you know, we're so focused on UIL, right? Especially in Texas, and we lose ourselves in that competition. We want those pretty badges, those trophies, you know, you're so- oh, sorry, for, for people that might not know outside of Texas, so this is sort of a, a state organized and run um, festival. A lot of other states call them festivals in the Pacific Northwest, that's what that's what it's called. Um, so it's a, a competition-based assessment for music ensembles, but it's not just music. It could be theater arts and, and visual arts and on sort of all sort of different academic disciplines. UIL specifically in the state of Texas actually branches almost all extracurricular activity not necessarily disciplines, but it covers athletics and forensics and performing arts and visual art. It doesn't actually have visual arts or dance. But um, so anyway, just to clarify for people that are outside of the state of Texas, this is sort of a competition, organized competition at the state level down to the local level for performing arts. So I just wanted to offer that. Well, and just to further clarify, UIL is definitely a state governing body. I mean, if you did a power analysis of UIL, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, and I've been wanting to like craft my... I don't attack <laughs> demands of UIL is that, you know, we have TEA saying it's totally safe to open schools and UIL is just not saying anything. In fact, UIL is allowing summer athletic conditioning to happen. UIL is allowing marching band practice to happen in person. They're leaving it up to the dis districts to decide that. And then that's all they say. And I guarantee you, if UIL came out tomorrow and said, it is unsafe. We're going to cancel our fall competition schedule because there's still a fall competition schedule for marching band, for athletics, for football games. If they came out yesterday and said it's unsafe, I guarantee you TEA would be like, yeah. And then TMEA, which is the Music Education Association, they'd be like, yes, because they really go hand in hand. TMEA is not going to come out and say anything until UIL does. They hold a lot of power in being able to ensure that we're keeping our students safe. And they hold a lot of power that restricts us from, again, addressing the holistic child because they yeah, are all well, assessment. And that's the thing that bothers me is it's not even, I mean, cause I don't want to, <laughs> I want to villainize equitably. I don't want to just villainize UIL. Just in general, I am concerned about educators and I'll put myself in this boat because I don't have all the answers. I don't want to, I don't want to give that impression, but to hear educators saying things like, well, if we're not going to go to festival, if we're not going to go to competition, what am I going to do with my students? People, that is a serious problem. If your only conception of your classroom is preparing for a concert or contest, period. I don't care what state you're in, what district you're in. If that's the only thing you understand in arts education to be, we have serious problems, serious problems to address. And you being from Texas understand that yeah. is such a strong mentality in Texas. And I know a lot of directors, again, have lost themselves from the spring to now. There's a lot of music directors that are purely concerned with you know, their biggest concern is how do I have my rehearsals? Well, you don't because the reality is it's COVID-19 and it's unsafe. So how about we start teaching culturally relevant pedagogy and music education, highlighting composers of color and highlighting, you know, the students cultural identity and what music enriches their lives and their families. There's so many things we can do now. And the funny part is teeks, which are the, you know, the, the, the standards of education in Texas, like every state has, for music, there are teaks for the historical context and the cultural relevance and, you know, improvisation. And so many of those teaks are just, you know, left by the wayside because we're so focused on the UIL competition. We're so focused on the fall concert that we're not actually doing the holistic music education that that's what music is about. That's what art is really about. And when that's what education is about. That's yeah. what that's what frustrates me. The fact that we're still talking about uh, just in general, the larger conversation, we still talk about music and art and, and theater and dance and we still other it. That like, well, that's going to be, you know, because Texas made the big shift when they published the um, and this is from uh, Tom Wagner 
uh, rest in peace, such an absolute, I mean, just a wonderful hallmark to uh, music and education and art education, incredible advocate. He worked for TA as the fine arts uh, coordinator for many years. Um, this was something that he said, so I'm, I'm quoting him. He always corrects me. It's Tex like Texas. Ah, okay. So he was with them when they authored it. Um, so I didn't want to confuse anyone because I was going to say Tex, but that's why I'm saying Tex from, from Tom Wagoner. I love him to death. Uh, he was there when they were authoring it. So with the text, with those standards, you know, there's there's an issue again of accountability of this is what we should be seeing. And it's about a holistic education. And the the texts were designed to be more inclusive and to challenge what's happening in the classroom. But it comes back down to the expectations of what we're seeing happen. And if we as music educators, and again, this is not just Texas, this is across the country, because you can see the same trends in all state published standards. If we are not finding ways to break some of those barriers and take advantage of the time that we're in now, uh, and I don't want to sully the dignity of the struggles that people are having. Uh, I, I know that this all probably sounds somewhat Pollyannish to say like, we have this opportunity and let's take advantage of it. Meanwhile, people are dying. So I'm not, I'm not pushing past the real trauma that they're experiencing. But the fact that we have this, you know, shaking clenched fist on systems that we have openly admitted were broken in public schooling while we're trying to survive a global pandemic, we need to, in a true uh, Titanic moment, right, beat that little frozen claw off of us to be able to drift away and, and actually move forward and actually say, okay, there are opportunities for us to change what is going on. I am, I am somewhat remiss because I can't believe it's been an hour and 20 minutes. We, we've come way over time. And I am absolutely going to be reaching out to you again. I want to respect the time of the people that are watching and your own time. You've been so gracious to, to be here so long. And I think this is worth revisiting again, not only to address, because we've made this beautiful transition now, I think, of how are we responding to opening schools in terms of facilitating learning? What does it look like? Is it competition-based? Is it performance-based? Is it rehearsal-based? Is it you know through the academics? Is it through the standards? Is it through the personal relationships that you're building with students in terms of SEL, like there's so much that needs to be talked about. So if you are willing, I want to connect with you again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just, before you go, I want to touch on what you just said. You know, you talk about text uh, and those are the standards. When the Texas standards are in direct conflict with the STAR assessment, there's an issue. And then yep. you talk about that icy fist holding us back and having to beat down. The only way we're going to get that icy fist off of us to move forward with progress is we, if we organize and have all of us together in unified demand, beating it down, and then we can move forward in progress. So thank you so much for having me. Hey, Mitt, there's, there's no better way to end it. For everybody that is watching and that may watch this in the archived videos, go vote, go be heard plug in to whatever outlets you have for communication with your local school district, not as, as Francesca said very well, not as an opportunity to complain or to villainize administrators, but to support each other, to keep the lines of communication open to find out what's effective and what's working and use them, be heard in your communities, not just the things that you're concerned about, but the things that are worth celebrating so that these administrators know what's working. Let's help support them and empower them so that they can make decisions that are best for our students and for our educators. Francesca, thank you for all of the work that you continue to do. If you guys uh, want to reach out to her, she's on social media and be able to support and share some of the amazing documents and uh, advocacy statements that she's been sharing. I, I know I've seen them on Facebook a whole bunch, but get plugged in and be a part of that solution. And I think arguably even more important, just be a part of the dialogue. It might not just be about creating the solution. It's just be a part of that dialogue and let your voice be heard. Your uh, That's so big. Yes. Hear your story. Yeah. Francesca, thank you so much. I'm going to end the live broadcast, but if we stick around, I just want to yeah. give you another personal thanks for being here. Thank you to everybody that's been watching and posting comments. It is fantastic to have all of you here with us and please feel free to share this video. Again, it'll be archived on my YouTube channel and you should see it floating around on Facebook still. Um, we're so excited to have this new platform. I think it worked out really well. So thank you all for being a part of this and we we'll look forward to seeing you next week for another Teacher Talk. Thank you.